Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Simply Unprofessional. I'm your host, Webby. Joining me tonight, we got Rob. Hey, everybody. I got a mouthful of potatoes. And we got a Devin. Hey, it's me, a Devin. I'm here. I got a Fago cream soda. Oh, what is a what? Uh, like a, from the Insane Clown Posse? I mean, they reference it, but it's like a... <clears throat> I, I mean, it's a Michigan company, but I don't believe it's, it's like Northeast, Northeastern, maybe. I don't know how far out they go. Yeah, it's a Fago pop. All right. Or soda for the you heathens out there. Um. All right. So we had talked about doing it, an episode on a movie that I got super <laughs> excited about when I saw it. Uh, but we, yes. we didn't sit down and watch the movie, so. That will most likely be in the next upcoming one of the next upcoming weeks. Uh, I do not want to. Well, no, nah, I think we'll leave it as a surprise when it comes out. Uh, but this week we're going to go back to rating some of the subclasses in D and D. So it is going to be a D and D centric episode. Um, so you don't like that? Too damn bad. We don't care. Exactly. Uh, if you don't want to listen about D and D stuff, then turn off the uh, <coughs> podcast. I already got your, you know, your <coughs> listen technically. So, uh, but yeah, this week we're going to be talking about the monk subclasses. Um, now with that, uh, before Rob has to run to go get Matilda. Why is she barking already? Uh, well, she's not yelping like she's stuck, and she's not jumping at the door, but she is barking a lot. But before you have to go, because it's inevitable that you're going to have to run and let Matilda in, and then probably out again before the end of the podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rob, why don't you run down just the monk's class features as a whole? Because I know I know you wanted to make it a point when we did the barbarian one to go through the barbarian class features. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the the class features that you start with, which can be affected by the the uh, subclasses, if they are, um, is you start with unarmored defense, which because monks don't generally use armor, it ups your armor class so that it makes you more difficult to hit, which allows you to use your dex and wisdom modifiers and add it to your uh, armor class. Um, You also get martial arts, which allows you to strike with your um, bare hands and do it at start. It's a d4 of damage, but as you level up, it gets higher and higher until eventually it becomes a d12. I have Um, a question for posterity sakes. It only goes up to d10. Uh, I thought it went up to d12. No. I thought it goes to d12. Nope. Maybe 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 that was a different edition. But, um, D10 from 17th to 20th level. Okay, then yeah, it was a different edition. I think it's three three point five would have been D12. But anyway, uh, when you say you can strike with bare hands, do you grow like bare arms to get the punch with bare arms? Or... I fucking wish. <laughs> exactly. I would always be a monk. I would be like, <laughs> I have the right to bare arms. Um, just asking yeah. for posterity's sake. It's just like that is a very important question. You can put bear arms on your wall. Yes, you have the right to bear arms. I think everybody should have the right to bear arms. <laughs> Me too. Uh, right. So, what else uh, do you get with martial arts other than your your <laughs> martial arts die? Uh, that you can strike with an armor if you make the attack action. You can strike an armor strike with your bonus action. As well, <clears throat> um, you can also use and dexterity. Then you can use, yeah, for any for your unarmed strikes or any monk weapons, you can use dexterity instead of strength. It's just back and forth. 
Uh, so if you have a higher strength, you can use your strength. If you have a higher dex, you can use dex. Most monks go with dex because it also increases their AC. Uh, and then, like I said, you can use the D4, because most characters, if you use an unarmed punch, you only do one damage plus your strength. Or if this does a D4 plus your dex or strength. On the second level, you get key, which is basically the points you spend to do mystical abilities. Um, you start off with Flurry of Blows, Patient Defense, and Step of the Wind. Flurry of Blows allows you to take an extra unarmed attack as your bonus action, so you can strike twice instead of once. Patient defense gives you the dodge action, which makes it uh, everyone that it tries to strike you has disadvantage. Step of the wind allows you to to dash uh, or disengage as a bonus action. <clears throat> uh, then you also get unarmed movement, so as long as you're not wearing armor, you can move an extra 10 feet. <clears throat> and at ninth level, that increases again. Or no, ninth level, you get to move across vertical surfaces and over liquids. <clears throat> Uh, at third level, you choose your subclass, which we're going to get into. You also get Deflect Missiles, which allows you to, if you are hit with a uh, ranged attack, you can reduce the damage. If you reduce it to zero, you actually catch whatever has been shot at you, and you can use a key point to throw it back. Uh, <coughs> uh, at fourth level, you get Slow Fall, which you can reduce the fall and damage taken by five times your monk level. <coughs> so you, when you're really high, you can just jump straight off cliffs and be fine. Uh, at fifth level, you get an extra attack, so you get to attack twice, and then also do your offhand martial arts strike. Uh, and you get the ability to do stunning strike, um, where if you hit a creature, you can spend a key point to make them take a constitution saving throw or be stunned, which means they can't do anything until the end of your next turn. Hands down, uh, one of the <clears throat> best monk abilities. Mm -hmm. For sure. At sixth level, you get unarmed strike. Uh, and it count as magical for the o purposes of overcoming magical uh, damage to non-magical attacks. So your uh, uh, bare fists are now <laughs> able to hit things that have a resistance to non-magical weapons. Uh, at 6th level, your unarmored speed increases to 15 feet instead of 10. Uh, at 7th level, you gain evasion, which is a lot like the rogue ability, where if you have to make a dex saving throw... To take half damage, if you succeed, you take no damage, and if you fail, you still only take half, which is very powerful. Uh, Stillness of Mind is another 7th level one. You cannot be. You can use a, um, an action to end a charmed or frightened effect on yourself. <clears throat> At 9th level, unarmed movement increases. Uh, oh, that's the one where you can run across vertical surfaces or over liquids without falling. 10th <clears throat> uh, is Purity of Body. Uh, which makes you immune to disease and poison. Uh, tenth level, your unarmed movement increases to 20 feet. Uh, at 13th, you get an ability called Tongue of the Sun and Moon, uh, where you can understand all spoken languages, um, and any creature that speaks a language can understand what you say. At uh, 14th level, you get Diamond Soul, which gives you proficiency in all saving throws. Uh, and whenever you make a saving throw and fail, you can spend one key point to re-roll it and take the second result. <clears throat> um, and then at 14th, your unarmed movement increases to 25 feet as well. At 15th level, you get Timeless Body. Um, you can't, uh, you don't get the frailty of old age. You can't be aged magically. You can still die of old age, but you don't feel any of the effects. Um, and you no longer need to drink water or eat food. Uh, and then at 18th, you get Empty Body, which uh, you can use four key points as a reaction to become invisible. Uh, and you have resistance to all damage except force damage. Um, you can spend eight key points to cast the Astral Projection spell without needing anything, <clears throat> without needing the material components. Um, but you can't take other creatures with you. And then at 18th level, your Unarmored Movement increases to 30 feet. And then at 20th, you get Perfect Self which is bleh, for 20th level power, is if you roll for initiative and you have no key points remaining, you gain four key points. <clears throat> Still better than the bard. Yeah, the bard is the worst. I don't know. I mean, the, this is four key points. The bard gains one... Uh, 
one bardic inspiration use. Yeah, the bard has the worst level seven spell slot too with it, though. Okay, true, but the bard (laughs) has the worst capstone in D anD. d But it's also the first nineteen levels of bard are probably all you really need (laughs) because the bard is an amazing class by itself. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Let me just finish writing down this list here, so we can rank them. Okay. Way of. Yeah, we are only going to be ranking the official. Um, I think there's what one, types. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of them. Yeah. So, so, all right. Uh, okay, so first up on the chopping block for us to talk about is uh, now. I will say, I have not, I have not played around too much with monks. Uh, I know both of you have played a monk. I'm trying to think. I don't. Mm, I think I've only played one monk, and it was only for a one shot. I've had some monk NPCs, but again, I haven't really played around too much. Uh, but the first one we're going to be talking about is the Way of Mercy monk. Um, what's that? Uh, what you're reading it? If we ever start doing tiny little top knot again, we should probably switch. Elspeth over to this because this is she's a way of tranquility monk, monk which is not the an actual uh, approved class, but it's very similar to this, so we might as well switch it over. <clears throat> well, I mean, I I had brought this up to you before, and you're like, "Well, I like this one. That's why I wanted to be this one." So I just let you keep being that one. Uh, well, I don't remember that conversation, but reading it, I mean, it's it's fine. It's a little less healing than she's got currently, but it, I, it's not that. Well, that's because the one that Elspeth has was you were a fucking paladin lay on hands on crack. Like, <laughs> yeah, you got more. With, like, you got more than a paladin on lay on hands. Yeah, <laughs> <clears throat> which I always thought was insane. Anyway, the way of mercy. So you, at third level, you get something called implements of mercy. Um. You gain proficiency in the insight and medicine skills, and you gain proficiency in the herbalism kit. Uh, You also gain a special mask, which you often wear when using the features of this subclass. You determine its appearance or generate it randomly by rolling on the merciful mask table. Uh, Then there's a table to just see what the mask looks like. Um... At third level, again, you get Hand of Healing... Uh, Your mystical touch can mend wounds. As an action, you can spend one key point to touch a creature and restore a number of hit points equal to a roll of your martial arts die plus your wisdom modifier. So, as we said before, the as you progress in monk levels, your martial arts die goes from a d4 up to an eventual d10. So, at max level, assuming you don't have any tomes of intellect or tomes of whatever heal. the wisdom one is. You can heal for 15. Uh, 1d10 plus 5. Yeah. Yeah. A max of 15 for one key point, which, I mean, that's nothing to scoff at. No, especially because there are items that boost your key points or boost your max total key points that you can get, like, I think it's like 22 key points or yeah. whatever. So, I mean, theoretically, if you're only using your key points to heal, you're yeah. doing that. Or if you read the second part of it, I just clipped my mic. Sorry about uh, that. Yeah. Um, when you use your floor, your blows. Oh. Well, no, when you use your Flurry of Blows, Didn't you can uh, replace one of the unarmed strikes with the use of this feature without spending a key point for it. So if you're fighting in close proximity, you can Flurry of Blows, get your second attack. You, with the same attack, you would get your martial arts, um, and then still use this to heal like someone in range of you. So that's not too bad. Right. Um, the other version of this uh, that you also get at third level is the Hand of Harm. Uh, you can use your key to inflict wounds. When you hit a creature with an unarmed strike, you can spend one key point to do extra da- extra necrotic damage equal to one roll of your martial arts die plus your wisdom modifier. Uh, you can use this feature only once per turn. So it, it's essentially just a little added oomph. Um, 
And monks, I don't believe there's no restrictions on how many, essentially how many key points you can spend in a turn, right? So like you could no, spend not. a key to do flurry of blows and spend a key point to do this hand of harm thing on top of that. Yes. Um, yeah, it depends on if what you're using it on says it's a, right. it's a an action. Like if you used it for... Yeah, your action dependent or <laughs> key point dependent. Yeah. Um, sixth level... You get Physician's Touch. You can administer even greater cures with a touch, and if you feel it's necessary, you can use your knowledge to cause harm. When you use your Hand of Healing on a creature, you can also end one disease or one of the following conditions affecting that creature. Blind, deafened, paralyzed, poisoned, or stunned. Uh, when you use your Hand of Harm on a creature, you can subject that creature to the poisoned condition until the end of your next turn. I mean that's pretty good. Uh, being a- especially really good. being able to heal and end an effect on someone that yep. a lot of those you can only really end if you use like a lesser restoration spell. Yeah, and a lot of those are also uh, saving throw dependent a lot of the time. And yeah. so like if they hit your barbarian with something that's um like uh, what's let me see poison's con that's fine. They hit your wizard. There you go with a like stunned or paralyzed. Oh, um, any wizard worth their salt should have a decent con modifier. I hear you, but I'm not saying it's going to always be yeah, the save true. is the issue. The that's save true. is the issue. Yeah, that is true. Uh, so uh, or, making a save, or even, that's much, it's much easier to slap them in the face or even um, if, and if, unstun them. If one of your allies gets, say, stunned, right, and you go before them in the turn order... Uh, instead of them wasting their turn and then having to try to resave at the end of their, you know, at the end of their turn, you could do this, heal them, and end the stuff. Yeah, so then they still have their turn, and they still have their turn. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. And I will say this before we go forward. Um, I have my personal feelings about the monk. Um, as a person who played monk, I hold monks in a close in a close place to my heart because there was monk was the first class I have ever played in in D and D. Um, back in third edition. However, <laughs> I do think monks have one issue um, that, and it's kind of a weird issue. I feel monks have all their subclasses are designed to make them implement another class, but they rarely, rarely do I find myself looking at the monk and going, "I understand what you're doing," but or. Yeah, I I, I want to play this over playing that. Um, for a numbers game point, I feel like the monk as a, as as a fun as the class can be. I feel like it's only a class you play purely for RP because like this seems like kind of like mixing a paladin because paladin can do the same thing with their uh, lay on hands; they can heal diseases and things like that too. It seems kind of like a paladin, but you're you kind of can do more as a paladin, at least as of right now, for what I'm seeing. Like, paladin has a little bit more of a defined... I feel like monks have a very poorly defined role in a party. That's a better way to put it. Um, and I feel like they can supplement and back up a role, and I feel like they play back up a lot of the time. They feel like they have very poorly defined roles in a party. So, like, nobody's ever, like, looking for their party. Like, you know what this party needs? A monk. We need a monk. Where, like, if your party doesn't have a rogue, sometimes that hurts. If you don't have a cleric or or some type of healer, sometimes that really hurts. If you don't have like a like a tank or like a good damage dealer, a good like frontline damage dealer, you feel it. But the monk's not really a class that can it can it can be frontline damage, but it's not really what it's for. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it can be a healer, but it's not really be, it's just, it's it's like a class that I think it's, fits poorly. I in, think it's more of a utility martial class. Exactly. It's a very utility class, but I feel like it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, this is great, but like, oh, you're this class, right? Like, oh, you're this class. Like, the, you're the you're a monk with a um, monk of mercy. Like, that's great. You also could have just been a paladin or been a second cleric. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so I was like, outside of like purely for an RP standpoint, if you're going for like, I guess like an optimal situation, I never, I never feel like a monk is like a required class where I feel like all the other classes kind of do share. You can kind of like 
change out certain classes. You know what I mean? You can change out like a wizard and a sorcerer. Like if you have one of them, like okay, or oh, you can kind of wizard sorcerer bard. You can change them out, but they both kind of run off different stats. But that's how I would probably say like more closely. Wizards in its own little niche, and then I would say like more closely to like bard and sorcerer. You can kind of change them out because um, nothing beats a wizard with prep. Nothing beats a wizard with prep or a cleric. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, other than that, like I do, I really enjoy the monk, but I do have a hard time like finding a way to fit a monk in a party to make them feel like they they they're unique in a in a weird way. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, I can understand that. Um, going from that, we have the 11th level Flurry of Healing and Harm. Uh, you can now... What the fuck? You can now meet? Met out a Flurry of Comfort and Hurt, I guess, whatever. I don't you know, use yeah, Flurry I don't know of You use Flurry of Blows, you can now replace each of the unarmed strikes... With the use of your hands of healing yeah, without spending key points for the doing healing. what you said, where you could use a key point to do flurry of blows and a key point to do the healing or harm. Now you just need one key point to do both. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. And then, in addition, when you make an unarmed strike with flurry of blows, you can use hand of harm with that strike without spending the key point for hand of harm. Uh, you can still use hand of harm only once per turn. So basically, you turn into Chansey, and you can double slap them for healing. You can double slap your your ally in the face to heal them. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you could before, but it would take like three because you'd need one key point for flurry of blows, and then one. Key well, point no, like with the with the hand, second right? part of hands of healing, you can replace one of the unarmed strikes. This lets you replace both of them. Yeah, for like one the way I'm reading. It. That yeah, it, yep, 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 for one key point, so you can replace both of them with healing. So basically, you just look at your. You look at your guy, you're like, are you hurting? He's like, yeah, I'm hurting. And then you just slap him across the face with a double slap real quick. And then you're like, feel better? He's just like, yep, I feel better. Yep. And yeah, I think uh, if nothing else, for the pure RP of slapping your friends to heal them, uh, this is a great class. <laughs> uh, the last thing in this class, in, in this archetype, um, is the Hand of Ultimate Mercy that you get at you have to say level. It, a you got to say a little more impactful than that, like the hand of ultimate mercy. Not going to do it. <clears throat> the hand of ultimate mercy. Uh, your mastery of life energy opens the door to the ultimate mercy. As an action, you can touch the corpse of a creature that died within the past 24 hours, expend five key points. Uh, the creature then returns to life, regaining a number of hit points equal to 4d10 plus your wisdom modifier. If the creature died while subject to any of the following conditions, it revives them. It revives with them removed. Uh, you So blind, deaf, and paralyzed, poisoned, and stunned. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. So this is essentially giving them the... Revivify. No, it's so this better is, than Revivify. This is the thing. This is, the thing. this is a great capstone, level 17 capstone, if you don't, if you play by the D&D &D rules. If that makes sense. Like, if you play in our group, I feel like there would be other caveats attached to this. Because it's a very powerful thing that's very spammable, and it kind of invalidates death. Um, Which I, I get. <laughs> Uh, like as long as there's a body to be found and they haven't died, it hasn't been more than 24 hours, you can always bring them back with five key points. And at level 17, five key points is like one-fourth, I think, of your reserve of key points. And you get your key points back on a short rest, if I believe. This is back in a long rest. You get your key points back, I believe, on a short rest. So, I mean... If you're playing by the book, like, just by the book with no... Your DM's like, yeah, it's fine. Re revive, you know... Revive spells are all are abundant. They're all over the place. Then I think this is a great ability. If you're playing like an art campaign, I feel like this would be a little less powerful just because there would be more caveats attached to it. I will say, especially if you're fighting an intelligent creature, this ability would paint a target on your back. The issue within the issue would be the does the intelligent creature would have to identify the type of monk I am to know I have it. And identify the type of level, what level I am to even know if I have access to it. 
Well, I mean, yes and no. If if I'm DMing a group, obviously, yeah, I know your guys' abilities and you know what classes you are and whatnot. But if, if I'm playing a, a, a an intelligent creature and you run around and you bitch slap your friend and heal them, you're a healer in my opinion, and you're going to be first on the chopping block. So fair, fair. Um, also, sidebar question: Is my heater showing up in the background? I wonder why nobody wants to play healers in your campaign. Can you hear? Uh, no, <laughs> you hear I, I, I don't hear anything in the background. All right, cool, because I'm cold. And you know what? It, that's fine if no one wants to play a healer in my campaign. I mean, it's not like you guys you guys don't fight extremely intelligent creatures all the time. Uh, but if no one wants to play a healer, it's just going to be that much more dangerous. I mean, in, but if I'm being completely honest, though, to be fair, to be fair, 5th edition is probably one of the only editions where... Like the absence of a healer, as long as you can, like, uh, absence of a dedicated healer, that makes sense. Like, I harken back to Atticus. Like, Atticus in fourth edition, I built him to be like a super healer because it was like it worked and it was like needed. When I brought, when I poured him over to 5e, he had too much healing. <laughs> it, yeah. was, it was absurd. Like, the amount of healing he could pump out in a turn was absurd and it was never needed. So like a good portion of my class was not utilized <laughs> because it was like, this is too much healing. Um, like a druid with the staff of healing or something like that is more than enough healing. Your group will ever need. <laughs> yeah. I mean, fifth in edition, most cases. it's, it is so hard in 5th edition, and no, I'm not saying that DM should be out to do this, but it is extremely hard in 5th edition to kill off a player. It is. It's not as hard as it was in 4th edition. I feel 4th edition was the hardest edition to kill off a player. Um, because of the of how you had to do it. Didn't you have to, like, double their life to kill them? Or some shit? <laughs> yeah, I don't think there was, like... St- I don't remember if there were, I don't think there was like death saving throws or anything like that. No, there, I don't think there was, or there was, but it was like, you had to, you had to damn near double their life to kill them. It was like, insane. but at the same time in fourth edition, if you were negative in your life hit points and unconscious or whatever, being healed didn't start from zero and bring you back up. I don't believe, I believe right. you actually had to um, heal them back up to zero and you into did. the positive. Yes, that, is, that is correct. That is. I mean, yeah, so it is, it is, it, it, I will say this, it is very hard to kill a semi-coordinated team in 5th edition. It is very right. easy to kill a player in 5th edition, Atticus, uh, Atticus being very, a prime example. Um, well, again, that example, you guys were fighting a very intelligent creature. Right, no, 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 I get it, I get yeah. it. Like, it's very hard to lose a character in 5th edition to, to like, a trivial boss. Like, a, right. you know what I mean? Like, you're going to have to lose your character to, like, something, like, outside of really unlucky rolls. Just, like, if everybody's rolling average across the board, DM and players included, uh, you're going to have... A, the, the DM's going to have a really hard time killing off your character unless it's, like, a legit... What would be considered, like, an uber boss, right? Right. But... And that's and I'm kind of okay with that to a degree. Uh, I, you know, as weird as it sounds, like I like my games more deadly. I do. Um, so, but I also think it depends on your team. It depends on your the group you're playing with. Like, if I was going to sit down and play a you know DM a game, and then, since he's just in this call, he's just not talking. But it was like you, Donnie, Rob, and throws like two other people in there that I know, like Anthony, that know how to work together, right? I'm going to be a much more ruthless and harder GM than right. I would on like a group of like people who cat just started and just who, who just started pl- or not even they just started or just started playing together. Right. If that makes sense. Like yeah. I know you guys all know how each other work. You guys know how to communicate. You guys know how to work things out to, I feel like you won't, even if I put something, put the odds against you, you will come up with a plan in battle that will let you at least get through it. It might be ugly, but you'll get through it. Right. Whereas somebody who, people who, if you throw them together, they don't really know each other and they don't really know how to like work together. You're going to have a much easier time like destroying them. Right. Um, so it's a little bit different. I think, I think that it takes a little foresight from the DM to understand that. Um, and then also not building fights that are legit unwinnable. 
<laughs> um, that's you know, so and that's kind of what it is. So we came kind of getting slightly derailed because yeah, we got uh, on the healing. But yeah, overall, uh, bringing it back around. Overall, I think this is one of the better monk classes. Um, so, I definitely think it's one of the better monk classes. On I a think scale, on a scale from like S being the top tier down through you know A, B, C, and D. Are we doing like pluses or minuses or no? Or just flat out yeah, letters? Yeah, we'll just do. I mean, yeah, we'll do pluses and minuses if you if you if you. Oh, if you in that case, that I will give this. In that case, in that case, to make the distinction because I, I feel this fits in like a high B, low A. I would give it. I'll give it an A minus. All right, so A minus from Devin. What about you, Rob? What do you give this one? Um, I'm gonna give it an. A, if this were in any world but ours, I would probably give it an S. But Devin's right about the ultimate hand of mercy being less and less effective every time you used it. So True. <laughs> yeah, because of our, the way our resurrection rules work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a very solid class uh, or solid archetype for a monk. Um Especially because it's not only healing, but you can do harm. So if you choose not to be a healer, or if you have a dedicated healer in the group, uh, backup healing is always awesome to have, and you can opt to use your hand of harm instead. Um, so I, yeah, I'm gonna also give it an A. And another like weird thing about this class, as weird as it sounds. I really think this class has a, the opportunity for actually a pretty solid amount of roleplay, um, just based on like how it's designed. You know, kind of like it really kind of embraces like the yin yang of the monk, kind of like the good and the bad. If that makes sense, yeah. Like you could easily play up your good side and your bad side. Like you could have like a healer that's really like peaceful, merciful healer, who or merciful character who has like this like mean streak evil side. That and that's like the harm part coming out. I mean, you know, and I, you know I, what you know, I would love to do if I ever played this this monk archetype in a campaign. I, I would be a multiple personality. I, I would have a character with multiple personality. I still want to do that one day. I would still love to do that, where I literally am playing a character that has multiple personalities, and I it's like ten multiple personalities, and, and just each one is a different class. A completely no, a completely different subclass of the uh, same class. Oh, so all the okay. core features are the same, but then like before anything that like happens, like you know, we just like me and the DM sit down and we like set aside like predetermined like triggers. So like if I take a quarter of my health in one in one attack, I have to roll randomly on a chart, and I have a chance of fucking yeah, that'd be shifting fun. <laughs> to a different cl- subclass. <laughs> and uh, it's just like I think it'd be really interesting. Are, a different, I know, a totally different class would be really funny, but I think it, it creates a lot of like issues within itself. I think that would be like that would be like the ultimate mode of that, where like you're like one second you're like a wizard who's like casting spells with no armor, and the next second you're like a fucking bar- fucking barbarian charging into combat raging. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Um, but like, I think it would just be easier to implement with different classes as opposed to different. I actual, feel like because of um, Mernon's new seventh level spell there and and the sword, he's like slowly slipping into multiple personality disorder. <laughs> I like it. I like it. He's like, I know I'm a wizard, but I like fucking hitting things with this sword. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the next the next archetype for monk. Uh, at this rate, you know I don't even know if we're gonna get through I'm all these. Say, I I could easily kill Mernon. By putting pit traps outside of every window, everywhere. Uh, but yes, true, because that's he only goes through windows. Like that's his thing. I wanted to give him a couple, a couple little unique like what up quirks, and that's one of them. He doesn't like door. He doesn't do doors. Uh, and he constantly apologizes. <laughs> uh, anyway, the next uh, archetype for monk is the only one that I've ever actually pl- actually played, and that's the way of shadow monk. Uh, right. so starting at third level, you get shadow arts. Uh, you can use your key to duplicate the effects of certain spells as an action. You can spend two key points to cast darkness, dark vision, pass without a trace or silence without providing material components. Additionally, you gain minor illusion cantrip if you don't already know it. Um, 
Shadow Step at 6th level, you gain the ability to step from one shadow into another. When you are in dim light or darkness as a bonus action, you can teleport up to 60 feet to an unoccupied space that you can see that is also in dim light or darkness. You then have advantage on the first melee attack you make before the end of the turn. Um, that would be a good combo with a rogue character. like a... For sure. I have my take on this, class. Uh, there's also, I believe there's a rogue one that also c- kind of focuses around like shadows and stuff like that. But I know there's really? a, there's also a sorcerer one that focuses. The shadow sorcerer, shadows. that's what, um, what's her name was? Yeah. Asha was. Um, they get some of the shadow dog. And let's see. Yeah. Uh, 11th level, you get Cloak of Shadows. You have learned to become one with the shadows. When you are in an area of dim light or darkness, you can use your action to become invisible. You remain invisible until you make an attack, cast a spell, or are in an area of bright light. And then finally, at level 17, you get Opportunist. Uh, You can exploit a creature's momentary distraction when it is hit by an attack. Whenever a creature within five feet of you is hit by an attack made by a creature other than you, you can use your reaction to make a melee attack against that creature. Um, I like the idea. I like the fact that they gave him an, they gave the monk an, an additional thing to use a reaction for. Yeah. Um, Cause it doesn't, I mean, you don't have shield unless you multi-class, so you can't use that as a reaction. Opportunity attacks are situational. So if you're and not, your in only real thing, reaction that you can kind of use is um uh is like catching an arrow but that's such also situational. Right. Um so anytime that you're given more things to do with your action economy, it's it's always a bonus in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I agree. I also think this is probably I haven't I haven't read into much of these other ones, but like this is this is one of my favorites as far as like thematic like you could RP mm-hmm. you know even role playing yep. and stuff like that this has a lot of different uses that you can use so that's kind of how I feel about this class I kind of feel there's a subclass I feel it's I feel RP potential is very very high and I feel like what it brings to the table is useful I do however feel like um, every time at least every time I've seen this it is in play it doesn't bring it brings a lot to the table um, for, I guess, like out of combat situations, but you, I don't. It's not too much outside of like opportunist, um, and shadow step occasionally, but then that's also kind of situational. It you, I feel like it, this class on paper has a well reads really well, but I was like, I feel like outside of that, like in actual use on the table, it's it does drop a little bit for me. Well, yeah, I mean, I will say this is this entire subclass for the monk is situational in itself because right. it's relying on being in dim light or darkness. Right, exactly. Which so, is which is fine. Which and I mean, is fine because it can party, create its own darkness. If if your party's kind of. out there and it's just like we fight during the day, it's like all right, well, yeah. it's, well, I mean, it, ha- it can create its own darkness, kind of with uh, with dark with uh, using two points to cast darkness and things like that. Right. But one thing it didn't do that, like the, for instance, the um, we'll get there later with astral self and on the shadow sorcerer, you get the ability to see through magical darkness. Yeah. Um. So it's kind of like shitty in that respect. If if it gave you the ability to see through magical darkness. And you could cast, if darkness was cast on a one key, I think it would be an amazing thing. Because you would literally just be like, cast darkness, spend a key point to cast darkness. You can see magical darkness. And then, you know, action, your second turn, you're shadow stepping into the darkness and fucking shit up from the shadows. Uh, I think that's how I would... It would be really cool, in my opinion, in that respect. Now, but an actuality on paper, it doesn't usually go that way. Now, I have a question for both of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, in regards to feats, specifically for this, if a feat had a pre- prerequisite of the ability to cast a spell, 
would you say that this particular monk could do that? Because you do have the minor illusion cantrip. That is a spell. Um, yeah. I mean, you do technically would, you would have the minor illusion cantrip. Is that, if it was just, if you take that part out of it, out of the shadow arts, I would say no. Yeah, because um, then you're just because just duplicating, you're, you're duplicating the effect. You're not casting right. the spell, but you do actually gain the minor illusion cantrip. Now, if it says you have to have a spell slot, that's a different thing. Right. Like if the feat says you have to have you have to have the ability to have spell slots, now, Rob, or whatever, then I would say no. Rob, what's your take on that? Would you agree on that? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's not just the minor illusion either, because it says you spend two key points to cast darkness, dark vision, pass without trace or silence. Technically, you're casting a spell. Right, but if you read like the the flavor of it, it says starting when you choose a tradition third level, you can use your key to duplicate the effects of certain spells. Hmm. Um, so although, I, yeah, I mean, although the next he's not wrong say, either. I'm just saying, like, yeah, you can, if you, you look at it them. from, well, you're I'll, casting it. The whole reason but, why I said this is you could always, if you wanted to take a feat and forgo an ability score improvement with this particular monk, you could always take the one that allows you to take a warlock pact feature, and take the one where you are able to see in magical darkness. That is true. That is true. Or you could, if you have high enough charisma, you could just take a sorcerer dump. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, because we, <laughs> we did establish that the level 20 capstone for for monks is not fantastic. So. Right, and I think sorcerers get their sorcerers get their thing at level 1, don't they? Or is it level 3? Uh, I, I, I don't remember. remember. I'll check. Uh, there might, even, there might even be a cleric subclass that Cause you get it is level game. one, you, you Sorcerer's get... Origin, level one, and yeah, Shadow Magic. At level Twilight one, you get... Gets the in Darkness, too, I believe. Yeah, and I don't I know mean, if it's Magical Darkness. So. And cler- Clerics get their their things at level one, so... <sighs> their yeah. archetypes. So, okay, so yeah, the Shadow Sorcerer gets it at level one, but it's not mag- they don't get their Magical Darkness. However, when they get third level, they learn the Darkness spell. It doesn't count against their number of spells known. And they can cast by spending two sorcery points or spend a spell slot. However, if you cast with sorcery points, you can see through it the darkness created by the spell. Yeah. Which means if you technically do that in level three, hear me out. Uh, if you do it to level three and you take that by itself, um, you gain a couple of things because you can also take as your meta magic, you can take quicken spell and you can quicken darkness. <laughs> As a spell, which then you can then theoretically jump in with your shadow step and start fucking shit up. Um, and then because you would still that would be you could you could quicken spell. I think you can get it down to it well, might be a bonus action or not. They're both well, bonus actions. Yeah, you can't have do, you can't do two bonus actions though. That's true. But monks can move fast as fuck. Yeah. So you could theoretically cast it. And then sprint in, and then start fucking shit up. <gasps> yep. Uh, okay, so Devin, how would you rate this? Archive? This class to me sounds like a solid, like a solid front runner for like what I would consider like a B class. Like picking it is not a bad option, in my opinion. Like you're not like you're not actively subtracting from your group at the table by picking this class. But I feel like. It, while I also it adds feel like it's going to be, as long as it's situationally met, like depending on your campaign. Yeah, I yeah, think this yeah. Would be I feel really like it's situ- exactly, exactly. I feel like it's for for a lot for all the reasons, role play for just situational, not situational. I feel like even if you can't take full advantage of this realistically and D and D, you're probably going to be able to do something with some darkness, yeah. and you can work some combinations together with your with your team to make some stuff work. So I mean, I feel like it's a solid B class. Where, like, if you take it, you're going to be, you're not subtracting from your group, you're not hurting the group by taking this class, and it's not going to hurt your experience playing, but generally, you're going to, there are better options. Yeah. All right, Rob, what's your, what's, what's your ranking on this one? Um, I would give it a B plus. All right. Uh, but mostly because of the, like, I don't rank it higher because it does require darkness for most of its abilities, which is, is doable but it doesn't make it like it's you can't use it all the time right again uh, it's it's gonna really sh- when you can use it you're gonna shine but when you can't use it you're i mean you're just a generic monk at that point yeah you know? um especially be- i ranked it 
a B plus, especially because of the opportunist ability. Which, like you said, because the only normal reactions a monk has are ca uh, catching arrows or the the slow fall. Those are the only two reactions a normal monk has. So this adds yeah. another one. No. Uh, I'm also going to give it a B plus uh, for all of the same reasons as as that as we all just discussed. Again, this is probably the only monk class that I've actually played. Um, never to a high level extent either, but uh, it's it's one that I always thought thematically would be a lot of fun to play. Um, so, question: Rob gave the Mercy an A plus, right? Uh, an A. An A. An A. You gave it. What'd you give it, Webby? An A. So. And you gave right, it an A I'll minus. Just, all right, cool. I'm, I'm just averaging them out. Yep. So then that, and then you, this one you Shadow, gave a, was a B was a B plus a for B, you guys. B plus you guys B plus. Like yep. So B. Uh, the next one I know is a <laughs> new one. I like how these there's all like so far they're Overwatch heroes. Like the first one was actually Mercy. I should say the second one is uh, Sombra, and then this one is Zenyatta. Uh, this one I know. Well, is you could say it was more. I would say more Reaper than Sombra, but. Uh, oh yeah, I guess. Die, die, die. Rob, do you want to read this one? The the way of the ascendant dragon. Ascendant. I, I don't have that. I have. All right, the way of the I'll take it. I got it in front of me. Oh, yeah. All right, I got it. All right, way of the ascendant dragon. As a follower of this monastic tradition, you decide how to unlock the power of dragons through your key. The ascendant dragon origin tables offer some possibilities. Uh, it's a D six. You can. It's just that's fluff. Level three, you get your draconic disciple at third level. You can channel draconic power to magnify your presence and imbue your unarmed strikes with the essence of a dragon's breath. You gain the following benefits. Draconic presence. If you fail a charisma, intimidation, or charisma perception check, persuasion check, sorry, uh, you can use your reaction to re-roll the check as you tap into the mighty presence of dragons. Once this feature turns a failure into a success, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. Draconic Strike. When you damage a target with an unarmed strike, you can change the damage type to acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison. Tongue of the Dragon. You learn to speak, read, and write Draconic or other one of the language of your choice. You also at third level get Breath of the Dragon. Uh, at third level, you can channel destructive waves of energy like those created by the dragons you emulate. When you take the attack action in your turn, you replace one of the attacks with an exhalation of Draconic energy in either a 20-foot cone or a 30-foot line. That is five feet wide. Your choice. Choose a damage type as to go fire, lightning, or poison. Each creature in that area must make a deck save. Throw against your key save. DC taking damage to the chosen type equal to two rolls or your martial arts die on a fail save or half as much on a successful one. At 11th level, the damage of this feature increases to three rolls of your martial arts die. You can use this feature a number of times per uh, equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. While you have no uses available, you can spend two key points to use this feature again. At 6th level, you get Wings Unfurled. At 6th level, when you use your Step of the Wind, you can unfurl spectral draconic wings from your back that vanish at the end of your turn. While the wings exist, you have a flying speed equal to your walking speed. You use this feature another number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Level 11, Aspect of the Worm. Um, at level 11, the power of your draconic spirit now radiates from you, warding your allies or inspiring fear in your enemies. As a bonus action, you can create an aura of draconic power that radiates 10 feet from you for one minute. For the duration, you gain one of the following effects of your choice. Frightful presence. When you create this aura, and as a bonus action on subsequent turns, you can choose a creature with an with aura. The target must succeed on a wisdom saving throw against your key save DC or become frightened of you by... For all of you for one minute. The target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on itself on a successful save. Resistance. Choose a damage type when you activate this aura. Acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison. You and your allies within the aura have resistance to that damage. Once you create this aura, you can't create it again until you finish a long rest, until you spend three key points to create it again. Ascendant Aspect, the capstone of this subclass. At 17th level, your Draconic Spirit reaches its peak. You gain the following benefits. Augment Breath. When you use your Breath of the Dragon, you can spend one key point to augment its shape and power. The exhalation of Draconic Energy becomes either a 60-foot cone or a 90-foot line that is 5 feet wide. Your choice. 
and each creature in that area takes damage equal to four rolls of your martial arts die in a fail save or half as much on a successful one. Blind sight. You gain blind sight out to 10 feet. Within that range, you can effectively see anything that isn't behind total cover, even if you are blinded or in darkness. Moreover, you can see an invisible creature within that range unless that creature successfully hides from you. And you got Explosive Fury. When you activate the aspect of the worm, Draconic Fury explodes from you. Choose any number of creatures you can see in your aura. Each of those creatures must succeed in a deck saving throw against your key save DC or take 3d10 acid, coal, fire, lightning, or poison damage. Your choice. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah, I mean, this has a mm-hmm. lot of choices for a subclass yep. for Monk. Uh, yep. And it, 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 it follows, thematically, it follows fantastic. You, you essentially become a mini dragon. Uh, uh, you do. You do. So. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how I feel about this class. I don't hate it. <laughs> Again, I think it's situationally very useful, and I think it would work better in a th- like in a, in a thematic sense. Right. Um, like for instance, like uh, there's certain aspects about it I really like. Right. Like out of the the first level three thing, the pre- the presence of striking the tongue. I think the strike is probably the best thing out there, right? Because at third level, you don't get your empowered key strikes to get, like, level six. So you're basically just punching around. So that gives you elemental damage at third level, which is super useful. Yep. When you're fighting something that's, like, resistance against, like, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing, you now have elemental damage at third level, which is, in most cases, the first thing in the party that you're the first person in the party that's going to get that outside of, like, cantrips and shit like that. So that's really cool. And the aura, the, the breath, resistance aura thing? Yeah, that's dope. The Breath of the Dragon, super dope. Um, I think it's really nice. It's relatively low damage at first, because you're, you're like, your martial arts die doesn't scale that high. I know for a fact, because I'm like, what, I'm level fucking 12 right now in my game, and I'm still rolling with D6s. So, yeah. That sucks. But, um, I mean, once you get up there to the D10s, I mean, 3D10, uh, without even necessarily using a key point, which is kind of nice. Because uh, Breath of the Dragon, you can just replace one of your attacks. It doesn't even require a key point to replace one of your attacks. So if someone's like further away from you, like perfect example would have been like yeah, in, uh, the, in the game the other day. When we were fighting the other day, I was trying to get distant on somebody. I couldn't get over there. So if I was this, I could like obviously have like punch, punch, knock that, kill that guy, and then my last attack shot out a 30 foot line of whatever type of damage I so chose to. Right. That's and it, I mean, it's cool. Also, it's a cool level, ability. There's, what level are we in that game? 12. You should be rolling D eights for your martial arts day. Did it not change it? Let me see. Now I'm curious. All this time, all this time I've been cheated. Okay. Um, now, now Rob, I, I also know that you don't have this in front of you cause you don't have it unlocked or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, while he was reading that, uh, what were some of your initial thoughts? Because you didn't, you you weren't really able to read and follow along with us. Like, did anything stand out when he was reading it? I mean, I always enjoyed the ability to fly, and that was like one of the first things. Yeah, I, the second he read that, I was like, "Well, Elsbeth wouldn't need her stupid fucking lava-filled boots." Uh. So yeah, I mean that was the number one thing. Was like, ooh, you could just fly. <laughs> uh, you guys one d eight, right? Yeah, if we're twelve, right. yeah. Oh my god, this changes everything. Uh, let's start with you, Rob. Uh, if you need clarification on anything, let us know. But what would you rate this at? At first, listen. I mean, I'd I'd probably say B plus. Another B plus for the Roberto. All right, Devin, what would you? You're the one who read it. Uh, what would you rate this? This I'm kind of in the same range of, of a B. I think it does add a lot to it, but also I feel a lot of the stuff it also adds to. You also can kind of get in a weird way. You get more uses of it, but you kind of can get the same thing by being a Dragonborn. I was just um, gonna say you you mentioned this at the beginning of this of this episode, and like so far it's like way of mercy monk. It's like yeah okay, so you want to be a paladin, cool. Way of shadow monk, cool. You want to be a rogue. Way of the ascended dragon, cool. You want to be a dragonborn? I, like, <laughs> <laughs> kid just been a dragonborn, like, bro. <laughs> that's 
Like, that's what I'm saying. Like it's and like, then if I if you like chose to be a dragon born way of the ascended you have redundant dragon, breath weapons. Yeah, you just you're doubling up you're on just, shit. Like, or you could just be like a weirdo, and you could be like a red dragon born that has like a acid that has breath. a cold breath <laughs> and be and be shunned by your village. Right, it could be a whole thing. Yeah, it could be a whole thing. I mean, I you do... were shunned from your barbarian village because you you cannot produce fire breath. I I do like I I do like it. Um, I think it's great thematically. I do feel like a, a lot of the things again are kind of situational. Yeah. Um. But again, where if you're That's put the- into if you're put into a situation where this this archetype can shine, you're going to fucking shine like a diamond. Like yeah, if you're uh, yeah, if you're exactly. in a wintry area and you're fighting a bunch of shit that's immune that's immune to cold but really like vulnerable against fire and you do just let out a fire breath you're fucking or if doing you're fighting a, a dragon damage. and you have your aura your resistance right. aura you right. and everyone within ten feet from you if they all kind of there if you, like you and all your frontline guys are resistant to fire damage right super useful yeah. you know what I mean I mean so that's kind of and this is kind of wrapping right back around to my rating. That's I'm gonna give it the same thing I gave the shadow because I feel like role play wise I think it's kind of cool uh, and when you can take full advantage of it I think it's a very cool ability and don't get me wrong like the ability to fly and all that stuff solid um, I'm gonna give it another B for me yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a B plus again same I did last time um, just because I I I, I really like the thematic aspect of this subclass. Yeah, same, same, so. same. All right, uh, Devin, uh, we're on to what you play currently. Yes, the way of the astral self. Uh, do you want to read this one, or do you want Rob to read this one, because he didn't get to read the last one? I mean, if Rob has this one up, he can read it. If not, I'll read it. I don't mind. Well, you are this kind of monk, so you go ahead. All right, Arms of the Astral Self, third level. At third level, your Mastery of Key allows you to summon a portion of your Astral Self. As a bonus action, you can spend one key point to summon the arms of your Astral Self. When you do so, each creature of your choice that you can see within 10 feet of you must succeed in a deck saving throw or take force damage equal to two rolls of your martial arts deck. For 10 minutes, these spectral arms hover near your shoulders or surround your arms, your choice. You determine the arms' appearance, and they vanish early if you are incapacitated or die. While the spectral arms are present, you gain the following benefits. You can use your wisdom modifier in place of your strength modifier when making strength checks and strength saving throws. You can use the spectral arms to make unarmed strikes. When you make an unarmed strike with the arms on your turn, your reach for it is five feet greater than normal. The unarmed strike you make with the arms can use your wisdom modifier in place of your strength or dex modifier for the attacks and damage roll, and their damage type is force. Level six, visions of the astral self. Yep. Question. Do you ever use the ability where when you activate this? I do and I don't. So hear me out. Um, the reason why I do and I don't, if I know we're getting into battle and like we have a turn for setup, I will just usually just activate them because I can then use my bonus action. Like in the instance with the um, the vampires, I knew we were going down there. I activated them ahead of time because I'm not bonus action hungry for going gotcha. into combat, and then I can still use my bonus action for, like, my flurry of blows and shit. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. That's the only reason. Other than that, I do use it occasionally, like, if we're starting combat and there ne- people are near me, or I can, like, just move and do it, and I don't feel like I need my bonus action. It just really depends. It just... It, it all boils down to, like, bonus action economy. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Sixth level. All right. Visage of the Astral Self. When you reach sixth level, you can summon the visage of your Astral Self as a bonus action, or as a part of the bonus action you take to activate Arms of Astral Self. You can spend one key point to summon the visage for ten minutes. It vanishes early if you're incapacitated or die. The spectral visage covers your face like a helmet or mask, and you determine its appearance. While the spectral visage is present, you gain the following benefits. Astral Sight. You can see normally in darkness, both magical and non-magical, to a distance of 120 feet. Wisdom of the Spirit. You have advantage in wisdom, insight, and charisma intimidation checks. Word of the Spirit. When you speak, you can direct your words to a creature of your choice that you can see within 60 feet of you, making it so only that creature can hear you. Alternatively, you can amplify your voice so that all creatures within 600 feet can hear you. Have you ever used Level this? Of- <laughs> I have. I used it yesterday when I yelled. Oh, um, right. But I also... 
Uh, I have used it uh, one other time to whisper something. I think it was back when I first got there um, in a fight. I did use it to say something to somebody. Okay. Hold on. Pause. Tomatoes, peppers, onions, and your quesadilla? Yes. Okay. Oh, Devin's getting a quesadilla! I <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, the one you know you, I hold am, on, you know you, what you gotta do now, right? When you get your quesadilla, you have to take a picture of it and post it in the SU. Because, I mean, this this is an SU. We have to have visual aids. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have to get it. Yeah, um, when you get it. And for those listening, there's a there's a dancing pizza lady in in the Discord currently. <laughs> I've been like actively making myself weaker this whole time. It's possible. This is the moment we figure this shit out. Devin's Devin's reading through this uh, this archetype and fixing his character sheet now. <laughs> yes, I am because I, I realized I fucked up. I don't know why I thought it was at thirteenth level. I got the body of the astral self, but no, I got it at fucking 11th level, which is very useful. I've been cucking my damage this whole time. <laughs> oh, yeah, so body, you can deal extra damage. You weren't doing that. No, no. Body <laughs> of the astral self. Starting at 11th level, when you have both your arms and vision summoned, you can cause the body of your astral self to appear. No action required. This special body covers your physical form like a suit of armor, connecting with the arms and visage. You determine its appearance. While the spectral body is present, you gain the following benefits. When you take acid, cold, fire, force, lightning, or thunder damage, you can redirect, reuse your reaction to deflect it. When you do so, the damage you take is reduced by 1d10 plus your wisdom modifier minimum of 1. I really wish you could throw this shit back, but it'd be, it would be too awesome. Um, empowered arms. Once on each of your turns, when you hit a target with the arms of the astral self, you can deal extra damage to the target equal to your martial arts die. Which, by the way, I was shorting myself on a whole martial arts die of damage. So I've just been doing, like, no damage when I should be doing way more damage. <laughs> I, I'm a sad boy now. Oh, uh, but, okay. Now, this is the level, this is where I want to get to. This is where I want to get to. Awakened Astral Self. Starting at 17th level, your connection to the Astral Self is complete, allowing you to unleash its full potential. As a bonus action, you can spend five key points to summon the arms, visage, and body of your Astral Self and awaken it for ten minutes. This awakening ends early if you're incapacitated or die. While your astral self is awakened, you gain the following benefits. Armor of the spirit. You gain plus two bonus to armor class. Astral barrage. When you use the extra attack features to attack twice, you can instead t- attack three times if all the attacks are made with their astral arms. Damn. Plus so three of blows. So that's five times. Yep, five, five attacks turn. Plus haste. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's I'm going to start throwing, I'm gonna start throwing <laughs> haste on you. Now let me ask you this, Devin, because I don't know if you've ever actually described what your astral visage or, or or body or whatever looks like. Is it is it like when the Power Rangers combine? Um, <laughs> not when they combine. No, <laughs> when they when they form like Voltron or whatever the fuck. Not Voltron, no, it's not like a Megazord. What the fuck? <laughs> Why not? Because it's not. Well, all right. <laughs> It's like Zenyatta, yeah. I told you. Yeah, no, like, D- Donnie's got it, right? It's basically a Susano. Like, it's a, it's a fucking Susano from, uh... Yeah. Well, that's why I joked and said it's basically a Susano from fucking Naruto. <laughs> those weak boys. Or, whether you'll understand this later, it's a, it's a stand from JoJo. Oh, I mean, I don't understand that yet, so... I said you'll understand that, yeah, you'll understand that later. All right. Basically, so this would this is basically a stand from JoJo. It comes later in later season. This is basically what a stand from JoJo. Is. Oh, all right. Just his pure force body, or I could literally just make it cover my own body and be like an armored dude. Yeah, it flies around. Uh, I right. so choose to do it. I can so change it by the whim. Let's start with Rob first. In how how you how would you rank the way of the astral self monk? Um, I will give it an A minus. I feel like this is kind of more thematic to it, what like an actual monk would be, like p- calling on like something beyond themselves to increase their power. Basically, like I don't know, it just seems more like a monk thing than most of the others. Okay. 
Uh, and all the extra attacks and damage that Devin hasn't been De- using. Devin has not been utilizing. <laughs> Uh, Devin, how would you rate now we're going that, to the next session now like, that you actually Devin's know damage. how it works? I know, right? <laughs> going to the next session is you make Devin's damage jumped up like twenty <laughs> points on average a turn. What the hell? Yeah, um, well, you know, honestly, you, you were forgetting how so, to do this. Your monk died. This, that, the other thing. <laughs> yeah. So hear me out. Um, with this particular class, as weird as it sounds, even though I play it, I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it like a B plus. And the reason why I'm going to give it a B plus is because while I think it's one of the better monk classes at just, if you want to play, like Rob said, it's very thematic thematic. Um, and it's very, it's like a thematic for what the monk is. Um, it's on brand for a monk. It does. And it does, I think dive more deeper. It does kind of in a weird way, fix a problem that I, the problem I talk about with monks were like, yeah, you're a monk, but you you're really just playing another a weaker version of another class. This doesn't feel like that. It's one of the few classes I think, well, subclasses that don't feel like you're playing another version of another class, or like or like the remnants of you're playing something completely different that no other class really can do. Right. With that being said, I do think this class offers very little on the side of utility, and it's just pretty much just for damage, purely for damage purposes. And it offers very little in the like for RP sake and your utility sake. So for that, for me, I'm going to give it a B plus. Now I have a question. Answer about maybe. our rankings. Okay. Are we allowed to take bias into account when we rank something? Uh, I mean, I'm trying not to, given the fact that I just lowered my class down to a B plus, even though I play the class. Um, but that's just me. Uh, you, 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 it's your show. You do what you want. Because you're going to do that anyway. <laughs> well, I will say, okay, with my bias, I, I, I was initially going to give this this class a C. I'm, I'm just not a fan of, of this particular subclass. Um, but based off of the actual just statistics and. and and how effective it is, uh, both in combat, out of combat, and the fact that, like you said, Devin, it's 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 so far it's the it's one of the first monk subclasses we've run into where it doesn't feel like you're trying to fill a different thing. Um, uh, yeah, I'll give it a. I'm gonna give it a B. The B. Yeah. So A Robbie gave it an A minus, you gave it a B, I gave it a B plus. Yeah. So that averages out to be a B plus. I'll get all the averages from you at the end. That's uh, the first one where it wasn't like a majority average. It was legit like no. I had to take the mean of <laughs> uh, <laughs> two of the three answers. Technically the next one on my list is unofficial material. It is it is it is uh, oh, critical no. role material. I'll read that one unless you want to. Nope, go ahead. I'll let you do that one. All right, so this one is the Way of the Cobalt Soul, which, uh, like you said, is on Critical Role. Their dear monk, played by Marisha. Be right back. Uh, So the first ability you get at level 3 is Extract extract Aspects. You mean at third level, when you choose your tradition, you can strike pressure points to extract crucial information about your foe, granting you insight about their combat ability. Whenever you hit a creature with one of the attacks granted by your flurry of blows, you mark them as analyzed. Whenever an analyzed creature misses you with an attack, you can immediately use your reaction to make an unarmed melee attack against that creature. This benefit lasts until you finish a short or long rest. In addition, you can learn the following attributes about the target. Damage vulnerabilities, damage resistances, damage immunities, and condition immunities. Uh, so I didn't. I actually didn't know about the if it misses the attack, you get to attack back at it. With that, I thought it was just the the learning stuff about it. Mm. Uh, sixth level ability is extort truth. At sixth level, you can hit a hidden cluster of nerves on a creature with precision, temporarily causing them to become mentally malleable. If you hit a creature with an armor attack. You can spend one key point to force them to make a charisma saving throw. On a failed save, the creature is unable to speak a deliberate lie, and all charisma checks directed at the creature are made with advantage for up to 10 minutes. 
You know if they succeeded or failed on their saving throw. The infected creature is aware of the effect and can thus avoid answering questions to which it would normally respond with a lie. Such a creature can be evasive in its answers as long as that effect lasts. So basically, it's an attack that causes zone of truth on one person. Oh, yeah. And makes them more easily charmed, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> God, there's a lot to this one. Uh, also, at 6th level, you get Mystical Erudition. Beginning at 6th level, you, uh, you've undergone extensive training with the Cobalt Soul teaching you extensively in history or lore from the monastery's cult collected volumes. You learn one language of your choice, and you gain proficiency with one of the following skills. Arcana, history, investigation, nature, or religion. Uh, if you already have proficiency in one of the listed skills, you can instead choose to double your proficiency bonus for an ability check made with that chosen proficiency. You gain an additional language and an additional skill proficiency from the above list with the ability to double the bonus of existing proficiencies from that list. At 11th uh, and 17th levels. At 11th and 17th, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, this does not have the normal caveat where most things that will double your proficiency say you cannot also... Uh, it cannot be something that you already have expertise in. This does, So I don't know if you can double it again for this, or if it's, that's just like they didn't... I, I think it's just the way that it's worded. It's essentially if you already have proficiency in one of those skills, you can get expertise because that's all expertise is. It's just doubling your proficiency bonus. Well, no, but a lot of things that like the the stuff like um, what the hell are they called? Uh, if you if you take instead of a uh, like level four instead of the I can't think. My brain is fried. Ability score improvement. Yeah. Other the, no, the other thing. That you can take instead of an ability score improvement. Feats. Feats. There you go. My, Another question. My, my bed, my head was burning. Uh, ooh, quesadilla. Per request. Why is... Oh my god, I just saw the dancing. Well, I will say this... <laughs> uh, but they usually have in parentheses, <sighs> this cannot be... cannot uh, Something that already has expertise cannot benefit from this ability, but this one doesn't. get double expertise. Right. But... This is uh, I don't know. I, I guess I'll have to look into that, but I, I, I feel like it's just essentially it's telling you you can have expertise in it if you're already proficient. I know I'm I'm saying that's that's what it, it says, but also every other one that does that specifically says you cannot it can't something cannot benefit from this if you already have something that doubles your proficiency, such as expertise. Right. But this one does not say that, so I don't know. It might just be they didn't think to put it in, or I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, Mind of Mercury. Starting at 11th level, you've honed your awareness and reflexes through mental aptitude and pattern recognition. Once per turn, if you've already taken your reaction, you may spend one key point to take an additional reaction. That's kind of cool. But as we said before, monk reactions are kind of uh, limited, so... yeah. So that's essentially just giving have you a, a an additional either, reaction. So. Yeah, if yeah. you spend a key point, you can take additional reaction. I guess you could do it as many times as you'd like too. Yeah, it doesn't say only, you know once per turn or whatever. Yeah, so I guess well, that could like you could do opportunity attacks a bunch, but. Uh, oh, just say wonder, once per turn. Never mind. Once yeah, per turn. Yeah. But like you could do you could do a reaction on other people's turns. That's true. So. So that means if you got like four archers in a row who decide to take fucking shots at you, you could just spend key points and catch all their arrows. True. So. Uh, okay, and the seventeenth level upon reaching seventeenth, the it's called debilitating barrage. Upon reaching seventeenth level, you gain the knowledge to temporary lower a creature's fortitude by striking it a series of pressure points. When you hit a creature with one of the attacks granted by your flurry of blows. You can spend three key points to cause the creature to suffer vulnerability to a damage type of your choice for one minute, or until they take damage of that type. The creature who is affected by this feature cannot be affected by it again for 24 hours. Yeah. So that'd be really good if you know, like, the next person going on after you 
is say like your hard hitting like barbarian and you know he has a uh, does slashing damage with an axe you mm-hmm. can literally do your flurry of blows and then cause the enemy to be vulnerable to slashing damage and then all of the damage done by the barbarian well the first attack made by the barbarian would do double damage essentially so, yeah, well, if you miss with the first attack, it's the first time that they take the damage of that type, then it falls off. Gotcha. So, uh, Rob, how would you rate the Cobalt Soul? I'd probably say B minus. Okay, any particular reason? Just because, unfortunately. The first ability, which is able to uh, extract vulnerabilities, damage resistance, immunities. Like, I use a lot of homebrew monsters, so that wouldn't have... But a lot of people know, like, metagaming know those kind of things for a lot of enemies already. So it's kind of like, eh. Uh, And then... I don't know. And then the last ability, like, it's cool, but you can only use it once ever for 24 hours like okay is that creature really going to be back in 24 hours or is this going to be the end of thing well you can only use it once on that creature for 24 hours if you're fighting a a bunch of different monsters at once that you i mean you could do it on each of them um granted it is only for the one attack essentially which i think if you're putting that 24 hour caps you know time time frame on it then yeah it it should be for like a round or you know, yeah. something a, a little bit longer. Although, I mean, causing anything to become vulnerable to a damage type is I mean, that's substantial. Um, you know, so like, was disintegrate like f- is that force damage? You know, so if if you cause them to become vulnerable to force damage, and then all of a sudden they get hit with a disintegrate spell the next round. That's insanity. You're, as long as it hits, you're automatically doing a minimum of like, 81 I mean, I, damage, 82 damage. I get it, but uh, at the same time, a, a single crit would do almost the same thing. True, but imagine if you crit with the vulnerability. Yeah. Well, I mean, how often is that going to happen? Well, I mean, that's true. I mean, that all depends, I guess, on your party makeup, because, like, there are certain things, like, where you could turn a hit into a crit, maybe. Um, it is super situational, I, I will say that. And with with you being able to only affect it, you know, a single creature once in a 24-hour period of time, I, I do get that, especially for your level 17th thing. It's it's a little on the weak side, I, I do I do agree. Uh, Devin, uh, I don't think you were here to hear much of it, but I was wh- not. What would you rate the Cobalt Soul? What I heard, I'd probably go like middle of the road, like B minus B. All right, I'll say B minus. Um, I mean, the the additional reaction thing is really really handy. Um, mystical erudition. You're just you're just becoming a skill monkey using that, essentially. Um, I don't. I'm I'm gonna go with a C. So B minus B minus C. Yep. What's the B minus? Is that what the average is? Yeah. Well, well two two B minus and a C, so we make it that way. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, moving on, we have the next one is Way of the Drunken Master. Uh, this one, when I first read it, it seems very fun to play, um, in my opinion. So, starting at third level, you get bonus proficiencies. When you choose this tradition at third level, you gain proficiency in performance skill if you don't already have it. Your martial arts technique mixes combat training with the precision of a dancer and the antics the antics of a jester. You also gain proficiency with the brewer's supplies if you don't already have it. Uh, also at third level, you get drunken technique. 
You learn how to twist and turn quickly as part of your flurry of blows. Whenever you use flurry of blows, you gain the benefit of the disengage action, and your walking speed increases by 10 feet until the end of your current turn. So essentially you could run in, attack, flurry of blows, and just GTFO. Um, unless you're fighting something with Sentinel, because then disengage doesn't fucking matter. Uh, tipsy Sway, starting at 6th level, you can move in sudden swaying ways. You gain the following benefits. Leap to your feet. When you're prone, you can stand up spending only 5 feet of your movement rather than half your speed. Redirect attack. When a creature misses you with a melee attack roll, you can spend 1 key point as a reaction to cause that attack to hit 1 creature of your choice other than the attacker that you can see within 5 feet of you. That's really good if you're super surrounded by people. Or if you hate your allies. Or if you, yeah, if you just, or if maybe you just don't want to get hit and you want you want the barbarian to get hit. Well, it says when a creature misses you, so you'd have to deliberately <laughs> want to oh, That's <laughs> true. Right. Well, hey, if, if if you're fighting smart people and they're like, oh, no one fight, no one attack the barbarian and stay the fuck away from me, then make that attack hit the barbarian. Then they can keep their rage going. Uh... Drunkard's luck, starting at 11th level, you always seem to get lucky, get a lucky bounce at the right moment. When you make an ability check, an attack roll, or a saving throw and have disadvantage on the roll, you can spend two key points to cancel the disadvantage for that roll. And finally, at 17th level, you get Intoxicated Frenzy. You gain the ability to make an overwhelming number of attacks against a group of enemies. When you use your Flurry of Blows, you can make up to three additional attacks, up to a total of five Flurry of Blow attacks, provided that each Flurry of Blow attack targets a different creature this turn. So that one, you do have to be surrounded. Yep, yep. Uh, this is very much one of those, like, I'm going to run into a group of enemies, cause some mayhem, and try to get away. Um, that's you realize you're a monk, and you're kind of squishy. And... But if you have a really high <laughs> AC, then your drunken technique thing comes into, or your uh, redirect attack comes into play, and I, I could I could definitely see it being a it fun class well. to play. It could go well, but more than likely it won't go bad. Yeah. Not to mention the the redirect attack takes up your reaction so you can only redirect one attack out of the people yeah. that are surrounding so like, you. I got this guy. So, <laughs> and if you're surrounded by bandits out. who can make two attacks every round, it's like, well, okay, I can redirect one of these misses. <laughs> um Sorry. But who knows too? Like if you if you have like the big bad boss and he attacks you and misses you and you redirect that at one of his minions and it manages to kill a minion, that's a pretty good feeling. Mm. You know, um, Devin, how would you rate this one? Ah, uh, for me, I, I don't know. This class doesn't do it for me. Uh, I think it's overly situational, and I think what you get out of it isn't anything like crazy. Um, and like you could take a feat that this does better. Like you could take lucky. And the lucky feat is a great feat that just kind of moots out two of this entire class's abilities. Like it moots out the redirect attack and it redirect and it moots out the drunkard's luck. And yeah. But what if I, you have I, lucky I, I, and this? <laughs> I mean that's fine, but I mean you're you're just spending key points where you don't cool. want to be like Lucky only lets you re-roll an attack, right? You can re-roll uh, an attack. Oh, you can uh, re-roll, you? I think, any dice. Any, any yeah, D20. you can re-roll any dice, whether it's against you or for you. Like So, if they have hit you, you can just re-roll the dice and then make, and give them one of the dice. You have to declare it technically before you know their modifier and shit, but with roll 20, that's kind of hard. Um, well, you just have to declare before the DM says whether it hits or not. So, right. like, if the if if an attack if a guy made an attack, it's like, oh, twenty. Right, but like, know, it's I rolled with 20, the idea of it being like, like oh, in well, person. So, uh, like, you see the DM roll a or the DM rolls like if he does a public roll, he does a, a rolls in front of you, rolls a just a plain d twenty. You don't know the modifiers. Well, he really rolls a plain d twenty, and it's a fifteen. It could be a fifteen. Your AC is twenty. You're like, all right, well, I'm good, but he has like plus like ten. So theoretically, you're supposed to say, you know, hey, 
on paper, like oh, I get what you're saying, like before you declared it's hit, but like a little bit of common sense. Like when you see the dice roll, it's like, oh shit, that's a pretty much it. That's over to ten. Lucky <laughs> roll. That's under a ten. We're good. Yeah. Like pretty much eleven or higher. You depending on what you're fighting against, you may want to just lucky roll. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. So for me, I'm gonna give it a C plus. A C plus. The reason I I asked about lucky is because drunk with luck doesn't get a reroll. It just you can cancel out disadvantage, which is kind of powerful if you think about it. I mean, but which is effectively rerolling it and giving giving somebody disadvantage or taking away their advantage. It's kind of the same thing. It's just not on, on exactly like if they, somebody attacks you with advantage and you lucky there you lucky them and you roll shitty. Well, you can give them the shitty roll regardless of their advantage. Yeah. Well. Huh. I yeah, I mean cuz yeah, luck you you would force them to take your roll. But still, I mean, I, I see Rob's thing with Drunkard's Luck being able to cancel out your disadvantage as... I mean, right, that right, is... no, right, right. Which, I mean, it, it's weird because, like, so that cancels out your disadvantage. Lucky kind of also does because when you make a attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you can spend one luck point to roll an additional d20. So you can, like, let's say you roll a, roll a nat 20, a nat 1, and then you Lucky... And you can replace one of the rolls. You can replace your shitty one with the lucky outcome. Right. I I, I do get so, that. So I mean, I mean that's that's it, also it, just at the end of the day, it winds up right. You right. know, I mean, regardless of how you look at luck it, lucky gains after a long rest. It just depends on what what all you're doing because it's at the end of the day you're gonna. I feel like this class is like not not key point hungry. I feel like you're spending key points on a lot of stuff that it's not. It's super situational and not overly useful I for me I, for me it just reads that way now that you've mentioned me, it, it though reads. i definitely see that this this particular subclass would be great with the lucky feet oh you know it would be it would be great with the lucky feet it would be but i mean any class is great with the lucky feet the lucky feet is just that yeah, good that's, that's <laughs> true it's the single best feet in the game all <laughs> right so you're giving it a c plus rob what will you rate this one I probably a B minus, like the the previous, just because it is very situational with a lot of its abilities. Like the this level seventeen one, if you're never surrounded by people, it's like okay, well, this is not useful at all. Or you're just intentionally putting yourself into dumb situations. Yeah. Like, all well, right, guys, I got this. I'm I mean, it is the it is the way there. of it is the way of the drunken master. So I mean, you're already going like, to be putting I, I yourself like into dumb subclass. situations. Hear me out. I feel like this subclass was intentionally designed to always be in a bar fight. Yes. Like everything in, in this subclass areas, things like that. is designed if you were always in a bar fight, but never in now, like an I in like an arena. <laughs> I will say, I will say, I feel like they've changed this. Uh because in the first iteration of this, I remember them one of the first things that you get at level three is you gain proficiency with Improvised, uh, weapons. improvised weapons, yeah, they and that's it. that's what made this this uh, subclass so much better for me personally. Because then right. you could literally walk right. into. Didn't they realize and that smack somebody with a plane and do being, full damage? Then you realize you can go around and being uh, use that and be um, fucking Keanu Reeves and kill people with a teacup. Yes, yeah, one hundred percent. That's fine, like, but and at a certain point, and you're using your monk, kind of and you're using your martial arts die. Right. That's at a certain it's point, it's kind of absurd. So that's so, why they got rid of it. No, nah, I still loved it. I, mean, I love it. It would have fit the but class. Uh, I'm gonna give this. God, I mean, I I like this class. The um, the disengage action just by doing flurry of blows is phenomenal. Drunkard's luck is great. Intoxicated frenzy is very situational. Ah. I mean, with the exception of the bonus proficiencies that you get at third level. I'm going to give this one an A-. minus. I like this class. I 
So we got a C plus, a B minus, and an A minus. Devin, what does that average out to? A B plus. No, a B minus, a C plus, and an A minus. A B minus, a C plus, and an A minus. Um, I think that averages out to. It's either a B or a B minus. Uh, yeah, it's like a B B minus. So we just I. If you're taking the highest and the lowest score, it'd be a B. No. If you're just averaging my C plus and your A minus, it goes to a B. All right. So here's where now I have a question for you boys because we've covered. You want to break six. this up and do part two next week? Well, that's what I was going to ask you because <laughs> we still have four more to go over and we're already at an hour and a half. Yeah. I mean, I'm fine. We can do that. We have five more to go over. We have five more to go. What? One, two, three. We have where the four elements, where the kin say, where the long death, where the open hand, and where the console. Oh, I don't have way of the long death on my list. Yeah. That's from Sword Coast. I didn't have the dragon one, so. <laughs> That's Sword Coast. Oh, all right. Uh, let me just write that in then. Way. What was it? Way of the long death? Way of the long death. Uh, so, Rob. Uh, would you want to split this episode up into two episodes? We probably should. All right. We go off on tangents. That is true. <laughs> but I mean, I feel like the tangents were actually like, you know, uh, a good part, a good part to it. Uh, yeah. So, Devin, I'm going to ask you for a couple averages here that I didn't write down first. Okay. Uh, B plus, A minus, and B. I'm guessing B plus, that... A minus, and B. Yeah. That's a B plus. Okay. A B. I, 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 already, I, I already averaged out the score, so if you want oh, to so, ask what class I'm uh, Ascendant Dragon, is that a B plus? Dragon, the average to a B plus. Uh, Shadow, B plus. Shadow, B plus. And Mercy, A. Mercy was A. A. All right. Yep. So, as of right now, we, we have... You know, another half a list to go through, but uh, Wave Mercy seems to be our top ranked uh, monk I'm gonna make subclass a so far. Prediction. I'm going to make a baldy prediction. What's that? Sun Soul's going to be the bottom. Oh, that's not a baldy prediction. No, I don't know. I haven't read Sun Soul in forever, but I feel like Four Elements was dog shit. <laughs> Four Elements is dog shit, and I feel like Sun, Sun Soul is more dog shit. Okay, I mean, uh, <laughs> hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna write this prediction on the back of this card. <laughs> Devin, Sun Soul is bottom. Rob, do you have a prediction of at least in our second? Uh, second uh, set, what you think no, is going to be yeah, the worst? I don't really know them all that well. Do you want to just have a guess? Um, I'll go with Wave the Kensi because I don't even know what the hell that is. Well, I can already tell you you're <laughs> wrong. <Okay. laughs> I told you I don't know. No, any that's, of them. Fine. that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Kensi is. Kensi is if there was ever a class that, if there was ever a character I wanted to dual class, it would be a Kinsei fighter. I'm going to give it, it a Kinsei to drag it down. Gonna gonna so dual class <laughs> it only it goes to a, a D. Kinsei How are you going to give it an F? <laughs> you just you hate it that much. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, I mean, the we're going to get to the way like, the we're going to get to the way the Kinsei and Rob's just going to be like, I refuse to be part of this conversation. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, man! All right. Uh, well, okay, so that was our first half of the the monk subclasses uh, ranking. Um, Rob, where do we have a science corner this week? No, I have a small one. I know now that um, NASA is converting electric cars into future moon rovers. So if we have a colony, they can run through uh, electricity rather than than fuel. NASA. Is run by dumb people. Okay. <laughs> Listen, all I know is they'd be better off with me working there. Well, the problem is I could teach them all about frost gas, giants. If they ran on gas, you'd have to truck gas from Earth to the moon constantly. Whereas if it runs on electric, they can use just solar energy to run 
rovers around the moon instead of having Yeah, but to... then how are you going to explore the dark side of the moon? There doesn't get sunlight on that side. There are things called batteries that yeah. charge in the sunlight, and then they can drive around in the dark until the battery gets low and then come back. Yeah, if they make it back. Oh, boy. <laughs> Well, it doesn't matter. No one will go to the dark side of the moon because it's covered with ice giants. That's right! Finally! <laughs> People know. The truth is out there. Devin, do we have life advice? <laughs> do we have life advice with Devin? I, we do. I have two pieces Stay of Stay away from the dark people. side of the moon, folks, unless you want no, to get stepped not, on by frost giants. Life advice right here. <laughs> My life advice for the day is everybody out there, take your responsibility seriously, but don't take yourself seriously. That's right. It's good life advice. I know it is. And then my second life advice is you cannot control how you are perceived. You only can control how you are presented. All right. I really thought you were going to say stay away from the dark side of the moon, but <laughs> no, I mean, I, I want to go to the dark side of the moon. I, I, I think the Chronicles of Riddick is a shitty movie, but pitch black is great. <laughs> oh shit. Maybe that's what's on the dark side of the moon. It's just Vin Diesel's face, man. <laughs> yeah. goggles. With goggles, Go into the yeah. Moon. yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, where can people find you on the internet, Rob? You can find me on Twitter at Confessor underscore X, and you can find me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Confessor X. And Devin, where can people find you on the interwebs? Uh, you guys can find me on uh, Twitter at uh, DMP underscore uh, Pookie. You can find me on Twitch at uh, Mr. D3. And as always, you can find me on eBay trying to. You know what? Trying to I'm sell trying... this copy of Chronicles of Riddick. Yes, trying. Yes, exactly. <laughs> trying to sell this copy of Chronicles of Riddick, which some people may say Riddick was a way of the Shadow Monk. Boom! Full circle, baby. Well, all right. Fair. Uh, as always, everybody, you guys can follow me on Twitter at Jack's Forest Walker, all one word. On Twitch at DM Webby and on eBay uh, buying Frost Giant. Books. Not buying Chronicles of Riddick. <laughs> yeah, not buying Chronicles of Riddick. Um, and I had a couple other things I wanted to say before I really signed off here, but I'm spacing it. So thank you for listening. We love you. Stay safe. Fuck Booster Gold. And never forget the spaghetti. Never forget this. Not to get sexy pizza lady. Or sexy pizza lady. That's true. <laughs> Never wanted to peel pepperoni off pizza so fast. That's all I'm saying. I want to see what's under there. Is that a weird, like, porn fetish? Like, cartoon foods? I don't understand. I feel like. It Probably. If it, if, it, if it wasn't, now that you said it, it is. It is now. <laughs>